Well, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to welcome you all to My Horse University's and eExtensions web series, the first one um, tonight. And Krishona Martinson um, from the University of Minnesota is with us tonight as the speaker. And then we also have Roger Becker, who will be assisting with questions. Dr. Martinson has been with the University of Minnesota Extension since 2001 and is current the equine extension specialist in the Department of Animal Science. She holds a PhD in weed science from the University of Minnesota and specializes in weed identification and control, poisonous plants, forage utilization management for horses. She also raises, breeds, and trains foundation quarter horses. And um, Roger Becker, is also from the University of Minnesota. His specific areas of responsibility include weed management strategies and annual and perennial systems. His current projects include management of purple, purple <laughs> loose strife in wetlands, garlic mustard and buckthorn in woodlands, and Canadian thistles in native prairies. If you could please welcome them both. And if you have questions, feel free to um, type in the chat window. And we will be taking questions throughout the presentation as well at the, as at the end. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Martinson. All right, well, thank you. All right, well, thank you very much, Kate. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Uh, it's a pleasure being here, and you can see here that this is myself and, and Roger. We're both doing a virtual wave. Um, Roger's probably doing a virtual type or something. But today we're all here to learn about poisonous plants um, and how they affect horses. And what we're going to do is going to start with a brief introduction so that we're all on the same page. We're then going to talk about um, poisonous plants. We're going to cover about um, 18 to 20 plants that are really common throughout uh, the U.S. Um, I'm not going to cover all of them, um, so if you have specific questions, feel free to ask. We're going to talk a little bit about weed control because, of course, people uh, want to know once they find out they have a poisonous plant, how do we get rid of that poisonous plant? And then finally, we're going to conclude with just a few steps to minimize um, poisonous plants in your pasture uh, and also in your hay fields. So basically, a weed is a plant growing out of place. Uh, and the reason that we don't want weeds in our pastures and our hay fields is because some of them are invasive which just means that it is a weed capable of displacing existing plants. So existing plants in this case would be beneficials, uh, like brome grass or orchard grass or timothy or anything we have purposely planted for the pasture or the hay field. Uh, and this is especially a concern um, when non-native weeds invade a native ecosystem. Also, some of these plants are noxious, which is actually a federal classification um, of weeds that are on a state or county noxious weed list. And noxious weeds must be controlled in all public and private land. But of course, the number one reason we're here is because a lot of these weeds um, do present a poisoning uh, opportunity to livestock and specifically horses. So why do we even care if weeds are there, let alone being poisonous? But weeds generally are less palatable, which means horses do n will not prefer to graze them. Uh, they're usually n less nutritious. Uh, they can be lower yielding. And they're also less dependable as a forage. Uh, they're also invasive, poisonous, or on the noxious weed list. So those are the, some of the main reasons that we want to eliminate uh, these weeds. And honestly, most toxicity is seen in the fall or during a drought or when feed is short. And that's why we wanted to have this webinar, this webcast in the fall, is a lot of people assume there's a lot of forage in their pasture, their horses are turned out, their horses are hungry, and plants they normally would not graze, they graze because they are hungry. Um, and of course, the same thing happens when feed is short, when you have a drought or things like that. And I know parts of the country always seem to be in um, some type of a drought. So especially this time of year, keep really close eye on your pastures. The good news is horses won't normally choose to eat these plants, but when they're hungry, uh, this is when you could um, see some poisoning. 
So first we're going to talk about annuals. And annuals is a classification of plants that take one year to complete their life cycle. So they go from seed to seed in one year. And there's uh, four of them that we're going to um, talk about. As far as weed control, with annuals, what you want to do is you want to stop them from producing more seed. So mowing is really your best bet, keeping that plant from producing seed. However, weeds are smart, they adapt, and I'm sure a lot of you have had pastures where you have consistently mowed your pasture, and what do the weeds do? They start growing right below that mower line. And sometimes in those cases, that's when you need to bring in a herbicide. Uh, but if you're going to use a herbicide, you need to be really cautious and always read and follow those label instructions. Um, and uh, also realize that most herbicides do carry a grazing restriction, which means the horses cannot graze in that pasture for seven, sometimes upwards of 30 days. And the same would be true for harvesting hay. There's a harvest restriction. Um, so you want to really pay attention to those. And if you are going to do that in your pasture, make sure you have a place to keep the horses off for that designated time. So the first one is foxtail. Uh, it's an annual. And it's not poisonous, but it actually is harmful. If you look at the pictures there, it's not the, it's not the grass portion of the foxtail that's a problem. It's actually the seed heads. If you see the seed head there on the screen, um, each of those little tiny hairs coming out, when it hooks into the seed, those are called awns, when that awn hooks into the seed, there's a little microscopic barb that hooks into the seed. So when the horses eat the seed head, those little tiny microscopic barbs get lodged in their tongue and their mouth and things like that. Uh, so really what happens is they have a lot of lip or tongue ulcers. So our recommendation is that if you have a hay field um, or a pasture that is more than 10% foxtail, you need to do something. Uh, the problem is if you have a grass pasture or a grass hay field, there's no way chemically to remove um, that grass weed from the beneficial grasses. So you're going to have to rely on things such as mowing, um, you know, beefing up the existing stand so it's more competitive. And this is actually a picture of some of those um, mouth ulcers. You can see here, this is a horse that unfortunately um, um, was deceased. And uh, the main problem with this horse is it was actually um, eating tickle grass, which is similar to foxtail, in that it has those barbs on those little hairs on the seed head. Uh, and this horse came into our, our U of M um, uh, vet med center, and it had so many of these ulcers in its mouth that the owners could not afford to actually have them all surgically removed so the horse, unfortunately, had to be put down. But again, this is a real problem, and you can see some of the results um, f from these uh, types of weeds. The second one is Eastern Black Nightshade. I get questions on this one a lot. Again, it's another annual. Um, in this one, it doesn't take a lot uh, to cause a poisoning. Ingestion of just half to 1% of the body weight can be toxic. So think of your average 1,000-pound horse and how much that would be. It affects the GI tract. So a lot of times, you'll see some clinical symptoms such as colic. And it's really the berries. It's the berries that cause the problem. And you can see here, these are some of the mature berries. When the berries aren't quite ripe, they're usually like a reddish color, and as they mature, um, they get this dark, this dark color. Uh, a lot of times, also, when horses are eating the berries, their tongues will be stained black. This is a, uh, there's a lot of dark stain in those berries, even if you're picking them out of your garden. It's a very common garden weed. Uh, it's in the same family as like potatoes and tomatoes. Uh, so if you pick out those berries and you get it on your hands, your hands will actually be stained black or, or dark color for quite some time. The same thing happens with the horse's mouth. Uh, controls for this, if you want to use a herbicide, um, things such as 2,4-D or dicamba. But again, you need to make sure um, that these products are licensed in the state that you're located in. The second one is common cockleburn. A lot of people are probably most familiar with cockleburr because of the burrs. The burrs are really not are, are really obnoxious to us because they get caught in the horse's mane and tail. There's big clumps. We have to work for hours to get them out or, or, or uh, clip the horse's mane. But actually, in the seedling stage, which is when the plant is very young, it actually is toxic. Um, it's very toxic to hogs and cattle, but it still can be toxic to horses. And common cockleburr is commonly found 
um, in dry lots or around old farmsteads, so it's a very common weed. But again, only the seedling um, is what causes the problem. And here's another picture of it, and you can see here the burrs, and again, that's mostly what we associate with with cocklebur, but this plant here in this picture would not really be the toxic concern. It's when the plant is very small. And again, we can see it here again. Um, again, a close-up of the burrs, and you can see that it's actually not that much weight. Only 0.25% body weight of a 1,000-pound animal is only 2.5 pounds. So it doesn't take a lot to cause a problem. And it affects, and it, uh, affects the liver, so some of the clinical signs that you'll see are colic, um, and of course a sign you never want to see is, is death. And then also some uh, weed seeds, uh, whether it's mustards or cockles or a variety of weed seeds, uh, they can all be a problem if they're in your horse's grain. Um, if your horse is out in the pasture grazing and happens to eat a mature plant, this is not what causes a problem. It's when there's abundance of these weed seeds actually in the horse's grain. So uh, basically, it affects the GI tract, and the clinical signs are very similar um, to colic. If any of you out there grow your own feed or forage, uh, it's very common for people to use bin run um, oats, which is basically oats right out of the field. The problem is oats can be a weedy crop. Um, there aren't a lot of herbicides out there to use to keep weeds out of the oats, so the oats and the weeds tend to grow together. When you harvest them, you're harvesting the oat grain, but you're also harvesting the weed seeds. And if you don't clean those oats and get rid of the weed seeds, it goes into your horse feed. So again, make sure that you're using cleaned um, seed, uh, and that if you are growing your own um, grain, that you somehow get it cleaned. So now we're going to talk about biannuals. And biannuals take two years to complete their life cycle. So what you'll see in the first year is just a big group of leaves called, called a rosette. Uh, they're usually um, kind of in a circular format, really close to the base of the ground. In the second year, what we see is we actually see the plant send up a seed stalk and produce seed. So the first year is vegetative, leaves only, and the second year is when the plant produces seed. So for weed control, mowing is really difficult in that first year because those plants, though, that leave, those leaves are really close to the ground. Um, there's no way that you can get your mower that low or there's no reason you'd want to get your mower that low. Um, so the first year, to get rid of these weeds, you probably have to use some type of a herbicide. Again, use caution and follow those labeled instructions. In the second year, when that plant is sending up that reproductive shoot um, and making seed, you could mow it at that time as long as, you, as long as you do it soon enough so those seeds don't mature and then go back into the soil to create more problems down the road for you. And the two we're going to talk about here are, wild, are poison hemlock and wild parsnip. So poison hemlock, these, these plants can actually be quite tall, two to seven feet in height. And the stems have kind of purplish dots on them. That's one of your keys to know um, that you're dealing with poison hemlock. The leaves also have a lacy appearance, kind of like a carrot leaf. They're very finely divided and appear to be lacy. And the flowers are white, and they're shaped like umbrellas. We call them umbels. So they're white and shaped like umbrellas. And you can see on the screen here how those are uh, little white groups of flowers, and again, shaped like that umbrella. Uh, it's found in wet sites and along streams. So if you have uh, a dry pasture, or if you're like me and you live on a sand plain, you don't have to worry about poison hemlock. But if you're fortunate enough to have a stream um, or something like that running through your horse property or maybe a wet area of your pasture, um, that's where you're going to have to scout for poison hemlock. All parts of the plant are very poisonous to all animals, both when eaten fresh and dried in hay. So if you have a hay field uh, that tends to be wet or maybe a corner of it tends to be wet, maybe a bit shaded, um, and maybe on dry years you can actually get in and harvest that, that forage, again, that's the areas where you'd want to look and scout. 
Uh, the seeds are especially poisonous for poison hemlock. Um, there are some herbicides you can use, uh, dicamba and or 2,4-D. And I should say that the herbicide recommendations, unless I say otherwise, are really used to control broadleaf weeds in a grass pasture. These are not recommendations that you should use if you have any kind of clover or alfalfa, either in a hayfield um, or in a pasture. Wild parsnip. Wild parsnip is very common and in certain parts of the country it is absolutely taking over. And this usually gets people's attention because wild parsnip is not only toxic to livestock, but also causes a photosensitive reaction or a severe sunburn in humans. Um, so when weeds start affecting humans, people start to pay a little bit closer attention. Uh, the stems are somewhat hairy and grooved, and this plant can also be quite tall, about two to five feet tall. Uh, the leaves are coarse with sawtooth edges, and you can see here a close-up of the leaf. And the flowers this time are yellow, and again, they're arranged in that umbel shape, kind of that umbrella type shape, but this time they're yellow. And they're commonly found in fields and along roadsides and along um, a lot of, of major interstates. Uh, you'll see wild parsnip. Um, I've seen it in Minnesota and Wisconsin. I was in Vermont um, last week. And it was also thick on all of their interstates. So it grows in a number of states um, over the US. If pulling it by hand, wear gloves and protective clothing um, as as contact can cause severe blistering of your skin. So if you're out in your horse pasture and you see a few of these plants, you think, hmm, I'm just going to pull them up. Make sure you have gloves on um, and long sleeve shirts um, and, of course, long pants uh, because you don't want this to come into contact with your skin. So the wild parsnips can, what causes a problem is, the, is something called uh, phoranicumarins. And of course, because weeds are wild, different plants have different levels of this toxic. Um, so we can't really give you a great estimate of what it takes um, to provide injury because the plants are so different. Um, severe sunburn can occur through skin contact or in the blood vessels due to, in, in, due to ingestion. So basically, a horse can have, um, get a severe sunburn if they're grazing it and the plant comes into contact with their muzzle. And you'll especially see it on horses that have a white blaze or light-colored horses like palominos or pintos or paints or anything that has a lot of white, Appaloosas. Um, you'll see that. But even dark-colored horses can still have the sunburn. It just isn't quite as evident. And of course, if the animal ingests the wild parsnip and hay, it still causes a problem. It then gets into their blood. It kind of, uh, the chemical kind of rises up and sits right beneath their skin. And again, it causes this severe sunburn reaction. The good news is, is that um, if you think your horse has gotten into wild parsnip, either in the pasture or accidentally with some, was fed some in the hay, this, this reaction only occurs in the presence of UV light. So all you need to do is put the horse in the barn, keep them away from UV light for about 24 to 48 hours until that toxin runs out of the horse's body um, via manure or urine. And the same would be for a person. If you would accidentally get it on your skin, make sure you protect that skin from UV light so you don't get the reaction. There are some herbicides that can be used, again, dicamba or 2,4-D. And it's really important to apply those herbicides in that first year's growth when you cannot mow, because you can see how close those leaves are to the ground, um, or, pl or, or um, prior to flowering. And again, mowing is a great option as long as you can get, um, get that plant mowed before that seed head gets really tall and mature. So I, I, I've seen there, there haven't been any um, um, questions. Do you guys have any questions on the annuals or on the biannuals? Before we move on to the bigger category here of the perennials. OK. I want to make sure that Roger you know, gets some work, you guys. So now we're going to move into perennials. And this is really where a lot of the poisonous plants resided in this category of weeds. Perennials survive for three or more years. Uh, just like perennials in your landscape, they last a long time. And of course, for poisonous plants, this isn't something um, that we want.
Uh, weed control for perennials really needs to be an integrated approach. Um, you need to do mowing. Uh, you need to do herbicides if needed, if you're comfortable with that. Um, you also need uh, to make sure that your pasture is competitive with these plants. So you need to make sure that your pasture has good fertility, good pH, that you're not overgrazing, that hopefully you are able to rotationally graze your horses, and that you're overseeding those thin areas. Because weeds take place in a pasture when you have an opening area, mostly due to overgrazing. And also here you can see that we, if you are going to um, do a herbicide application, it's really best to do it in the fall. That's because in the fall, perennials are taking all of their nutrients to survive winter and they're, and they're putting them into their roots. So they're translocating all that energy into their roots. So if you use a herbicide and spray a herbicide in the fall, the herbicide will also go down into those uh, into those weeds roots and that's how you kill a perennial as you kill the root um, but again be very careful with those herbicides I can't emphasize it enough to always read the labels and to follow all of the directions so the first one is water hemlock um, and this is one that a lot of experts consider to be one of the most toxic plants out there uh, small white flowers again they're shaped in that umble type um, arrangement, that umbrella type arrangement, and it's really found in wet areas like swampy areas or marshes or wet meadows, also along stream banks and low roadsides. So again, if you have a really dry pasture, you wouldn't have to worry so much about water hemlock, but if you have a wet area, a stream or a woods where your horses go in and out of, you really need to be on the lookout for water hemlock. Uh, the toxicity decreases throughout the growing season, um, and the toxicity of the above ground plants is probably very little when it's dry, um, which means that it usually isn't a problem in hay. When eaten fresh, it can be a problem. When it's eaten in hay, not so much of a problem. The roots, however, are toxic at all times, even when it's baled up in hay. But how do the horses get to the roots? Well, because this usually grows in a wet or a marshy area, the soil is usually pretty loose, and horses have a tremendous amount of force when they graze, so when they go down to grab a bite full of grass or they accidentally get this, the hemlock in their mouth, they pull up, they can easily pull up the whole plant. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen where you'll be riding your horse down the trail, your horse goes to take a bite of grass, they pull the entire plant up, roots and all, and that's how the horses ingest the root. Again, the most poisonous part of water hemlock, and it's most severe because it only takes eight ounces to kill a mature thousand pound horse, and eight ounces is not a lot. You can see there on the picture how hefty those roots are. They're big tap roots. They kind of look, they kind of look, look like carrots. So signs will develop within an hour after your horse has ingested water hemlock, and they include nervousness, dilated pupils, muple, um, muscle trembles, difficulty breathing, falling down, and convulsion. So obviously it would be a very dis uh, distressing thing for a horse owner to see their horse doing this. Unfortunately, death is usually the end point of this, and it usually occurs within 30 minutes of the onset of these symptoms and signs. Um, so again, it only takes eight ounces, and usually the prognosis is in a very short period of time, uh, your horse will be dead. That's why a lot of people consider this to be the most severe toxic plant. There are some herbicides you can use, dicamp and 2,4-D. Um, again, make sure uh, that they're labeled for your state, and do other things um, to make sure your horse doesn't come into contact with water hemlock. And maybe that includes fencing them out of these lower, wetter areas. And there's other reasons from a disease in, uh, standpoint, like insect transmitted diseases, and also hoof problems, why you would want to keep your horses out of those wet areas. The next one is horiolissum. Um, horiolissum tends to be very common um, in the north central part of the country or the um, central part of the country, um, but the problem is horiolissum is really an issue with hay. And as we know, hay is trucked all over the country. Uh, for example, uh, this spring I had several calls um, from a feed store in Georgia that had got several semi-loads of hay from Minnesota that had a lot of horiolissum in it. And even though they didn't have horiolissum in Georgia, they did now in their hay because it came from the upper Midwest where horiolissum is very common. 
And what you'll see with horses that ingest horeolysum is that they have a lot of depression and fever, but the telltale sign is they get very, very large legs called stocking up, usually um, on their back two legs, and it's the lower part of their legs will get extremely large. Um, and it's very soon after ingestion, usually 12 to 24 hours. Uh, the good news is that these clinical signs will normally go away two to four days following removal. So if you give, if you accidentally feed your horse some horeolysum hay, contaminated hay, you notice it right away, you pull it away, usually within a day or two, a lot of that stocking up will go down. And again, it's the biggest concern in hay, in a pasture, the horses will not choose to graze it unless they're absolutely starving. And severe symptoms have been uh, observed in horses ingesting hay that contains 30% or more of horeolysum, and that's a lot of horeolysum. That means that one-third of your hay is horeolysum. And you can see here from the picture that it looks different from alfalfa and obviously from grass. Again, little tiny white flowers, it's a very petite plant. It's kind of a grayish green in color, and it looks kind of wiry. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of big leaves. The leaves are very petite and small. And the other interesting thing is that not all horses react. Kind of like allergic reactions in humans, horses do tend to react differently to, to horeolysum. And we do see that about 45% of horses do tend to have um, a, se a severe reaction, uh, and the other horses seem to be unaffected by it. Death has not been dis uh, observed with horeolysum. However, we have seen founder in a few rare cases uh, where the horse has an additional stress. So for example, a, a horse owner would go out, would see that the horse's back legs are severely stocked up. Their first thought is, I gotta get him to the vet, something must be wrong. They put the horse into a trailer. Uh, the horse is nervous because now it's separated from its herd. It's in the trailer. That additional stress is what we've seen has led to founder. Um, so if you think your horse has ingested horeolysum, the best thing to do is remove Remove the hay source immediately. You can call your veterinarian for any kind of support of a treatment, but keep the horse calm. Keep them in their normal setting so that you do not um, introduce any additional stress. And basically, hay containing horeolysum should not be fed to horses. We used to say hay containing 20% or more should not be fed, but there are those few horses that even one or two stems of horeolysum, they will react. So unless you know for sure that your horse doesn't react, you can maybe let a few um, stems of horeolysum in your hay, but honestly, it is something you want to keep out of your hay because each horse does react quite differently. White snake root. This is another common one that we see in a lot of parts of the country. Uh, it's a medium-sized plant, about one to three feet tall, and the leaves kind of have a saw-toothed edge, and again, the flowers are white. I once had a horse owner tell me, so anything that has a white flower is bad. And actually, that's kind of true. A lot of these plants that are poisonous do tend to have these white um, kind of umbrella or umbel-shaped flowers. So again, um, a white flower, and I don't know if you guys can see um, my pointer on the screen, but it has these saw-toothed edges, which just means the edge of the leaf is kind of roughed up. Um, it's only found in shady areas, so again, if you have an open pasture with no trees, you would not find white snake root, but if you had a heavily shaded area, this would be one of the first places that you would look. And there's actually quite a range for the toxic dose. Um, one to ten pounds of the plant material is considered the toxic dose because each plant of white snake root obviously contains a little bit more or a little bit less of the toxin. Buttercup. Buttercup is one that we don't consider poisonous, but again, it's harmful. Um, there are several species of buttercup. Some are annuals, uh, some are perennials. Uh, this one here, I believe, is, a, is tall buttercup. Roger, you can type in the notes if that isn't uh, correct. And what it does, it affects the lower GI tract, but what most people see is blistering of the lips and the mouth. So if a horse comes into contact with buttercup when they're grazing, it will look like they almost have acne on their muzzle. Again, more apparent with horses that have light colored skin. Um, probably a little harder to see with horses with dark colored skin like blacks or bays or browns. Uh, you also often can see the horses are kind of colicky, but again, it's that visual acne look on their muzzle um, that's very apparent. There are some herbicides you can use, but again, mowing and good pasture management will really help you come a long ways um, in getting rid of, of buttercup. Field horsetail. 
Uh, this one confuses a lot of people. Okay, and Roger said the last one was tall buttercup, so that's good. Uh, this one here is field horse tail. I've had a lot of horse owners be so happy that they have baby pine trees growing in their horse pasture, and when they bring me the field horse tail, um, or they bring me the plant, it's actually field horse tail. Um, field horse tail is a poisonous plant, but the difference in this, it's not immediate reaction. Field horse tail and bracken fern, which is coming up, both of these plants, it's a long-term process. Horses have to eat a significant amount of field horse tail. It has to be a majority of their diet for 30 days or more. So this is something that's an accumulated effect um, over the course of about 30 days. And field horse tail is kind of unique looking. Um, the stems are tough and kind of wiry, and they're hollow and it's jointed. And it's usually found um, on wet areas or right on the water's edge. It does need um, some moisture. You can chemically control this, but you need to be very careful because uh, it usually is growing near a water source, an extra precaution, and in a lot of cases you need a license or a permit um, from your Department of Natural Resources or whatever it's called in your area um, to do any kind of a herbicide treatment around a water source. So again, just be cautious and you may want to think about fencing your horses out of these wet or marshy areas um, in the first place. So the next one that has a similar um, type of poisoning is bracken fern. Again, it needs to be a significant part of their diet, 20% in this case, for 30 days or more. Um, and honestly, bracken fern, it looks like ornamental ferns or ferns you would purposely plant, and they're actually quite hard to tell apart. Uh, maybe Roger or other people are better at it. I'm not an expert at fern identification. Um, but it's found in open pastures, woodlands, and particularly on acidic soils. So um, acidic soils that have a lower pH. So maybe in an area you've, you've renovated that once had a lot of pine trees um, or things of that nature. So again, bracken fern and field horsetail is an accumulated fact a lot of their diet over a long period of time. And this is another picture of the bracken fern. And what it does is it affects um, the brain, and what you'll usually see is seizures. And the same thing is with the field horsetail. So you see seizures as kind of a symptom. Uh, and there are things that can control bracken fern, um, but you most likely will need a license because a lot of times they are a restricted use product um, because you kind of have to. Uh, uh, it, it takes a lot to, to, to control these plants. Do you guys have any questions about the perennials? For Roger or for myself or for anything else that was said to this point? All right, well, Roger, just wait, and I see he's been chatting a little bit about the bracken fern. Uh, so the next thing we're going to cover is ornamentals. We get a lot of questions on ornamentals, most likely because people want to know what they can and cannot plant around their barn, around their house, um, in, in horse-type developments. But also a lot of people buy places that have overgrown ornamentals and overgrown vegetation, and they want to know what they can do with it and if it will hurt the horse. So we're going to talk about a lot of these um, uh, ewes and foxgloves and rhododendron, uh, oleander, and you know the, the really the control for these is avoidance or removal of the species. So first we have Japanese yew. Uh, it was introduced um, as a landscape uh, ornamental and it's very popular in a lot, a lot of parts of the country. But you need to keep in mind that if you have a horse farm, this is not an ornamental that you want to plant. And you should never put clippings um, into the pasture or you never want to put you wreaths on box stall doors because basically it causes death and in fairly small quantities. So um, I know a lot of people um, are kind of you know creeping up to the holiday season. You want to dress up your barns. You want to put wreaths on the box stall fronts. It does look really nice. But the problem is a lot of those wreaths or some of those wreaths can be you. Um, 
They're, they keep their color, they're nice and green, they look nice, and you can see here the picture of this one, it has some red berries on it. But the problem is, you know how horses are, they like to kind of nibble and check things out. A horse puts its head over the box stall front, nibbles on some of that Japanese you, you come back in the morning and unfortunately your horse is probably going to be dead. So avoid um, planting you in and around your horse farm in your house, and do not put those you wreaths on your um, on your box stall fronts. The other ones that all kind of fit into another kind of similar category is foxglove, rhododendron, and oleander. And I do have some pictures coming up. Again, it's, it's avoiding planting any of these near uh, your house or your horse barn. Um, they're extremely poisonous to several species of livestock and even oleander uh, to humans. And again, a lot of people have problems because they're overgrown, they move into a place, and these, you know, these ornamental species are very attractive. So I can see why people would want to plant them. Um, and two, uh, there's been a lot of cases where a neighbor has trimmed up his shrubs, his or her shrubs. They don't know what to do with the trimming, so what do they do? They toss them over the fence to your horse, your horse eats them, and unfortunately the symptoms here are death. So there's the picture of foxglove. Uh, is the first one. The middle one is rhododendron. It's a very attractive uh, ornamental. And then finally, oleander. Um, the first one, foxglove, is more of a flower type. Rhododendron and, and oleander are kind of shrubby, or some people consider them small trees. Do you guys have any questions for Roger or for myself on the ornamentals? Okay, the next we're going to cover is woody species. We get a lot of questions about trees and what people can do. And again, like the ornamentals, really the, the key to this is avoiding it or species removal from your horse pasture. So the first one is choke cherry or any, pl or any types of trees or shrubs in that cherry family. Um, the choke cherry bark, leaves, and seeds, so basically the entire plant, are quite poisonous. Um, the damaged leaves pose the greatest risk. So how do the leaves get damaged? Well, this time of the year, um, if you're in an, uh, a seasonal area, um, you have fall leaf shed. After a large storm, you may have some plants that have blown down um, because of wind. And of course, you want to avoid planting choke cherry around horses. And cyanide is a, is a toxin. I think a lot of us are familiar with cyanide, even from a human um, health perspective. But of course, the interesting thing is, is that the berries um, aren't toxic because, of course, people use uh, cherries as an edible food and in jams and jellies and things of that nature. So if you do have a horse that ingests um, choke cherry or any kind of the cherries, what you'll see is the horses will be anxious, they'll have breathing problems, um, staggering, uh, the collapse, and eventually death. And again, all of these are very alarming things for a horse owner to see their horse going through. The next one is black walnut. Um, black walnut is really only a problem in shavings. Uh, there are some other issues with the black walnut trees. Um, mostly because where a black walnut tree grows, uh, it has an allelopathy or a chemical it submits that it doesn't let anything else grow around it. It's a way for that tree to avoid any kind of competition for that tree's nutrients. Um, but the problem for a horse is really when they stand on black walnut shavings. And you can see here this picture. Uh, this picture here you can see in the center is black. Um, that's a black walnut. And then the light color shavings all around it is the light colored pine shavings, which of course most of us are familiar with. And it really affects the vascular organs in the horse. And what you'll see is stocking up and founder. Again, like Coriolisum, their back legs, and, and in this case, their front legs will get very, very large. And again, the key here is to not use dark shavings um, for bedding. We've also had a few cases um, where people have had a lot of black walnut available on their property and have constructed maybe a wood floor in their barn out of black walnut just because it was abundant. Although black walnut is a very sought after wood for carpentry and other means like that. Um, but again, in that case, even if it's abundant, you would not want to use black walnut um, for any kind of building around, um, around a horse barn, especially if the horse will be standing on it. The next one is maples. We get a lot of questions about maples. Um, the key to maples 
is that the unwilted leaves or the leaves that are healthy are not poisonous. It's when the plants become wilted. Uh, so this time of the year when we have fall leaf shed or again after a storm um, when those plants have blown down, that's when you want to watch for any kind of poisoning. An ingestion of um, one to three pounds of the wilted leaves for a thousand pound horse is when you're going to start to see some problems. And what you usually see is colic and or that reddish or brown urine. Um, again, that's a, that's a symptom and that is starting to affect the red blood cells in the liver in the horse. So again, if you're riding your horse down a trail and your horse reaches out and grabs a bite full of maple leaves off the tree, that's not the problem. The problem is once they're wilted. So the biggest key is after you have a significant storm, um, whether it's heavy wind or rain um, or some more severe storm, you need to go out and walk your horse pasture, especially if you have maples in there. You want to go out if there's a significant amount of, um, of down branches and down leaves, maybe take your horses off that pasture for a couple of weeks until those leaves have completely dried or if a small enough area, go in there, rake it up and take those dried leaves and stems out of your horse pasture. But of course, if it's a huge area, that probably isn't practical. Um, so just keep your horses fenced out until those leaves are completely wilted. The other one is oaks. Um, and here it's the acorns. Um, but it's the acorns that are immature. It's the acorns with the green hulls attached. So you can see here in the picture that it's not the brown acorns that we're used to seeing the squirrels carrying away that are mature. Again, it's those green acorns that are immature. And it takes a lot of acorns. Uh, we have not been able to find any scientific literature that shows how much acorns, but um, it's probably, I mean, it's a lot, probably several five-gallon bucketfuls. I do have people tell me all the time that their horses love to snack on acorns, but if they're, if they're snacking on the mature brown acorns, that's not the issue. But if they're snacking on the green immature acorns, you do not want to allow that to happen because of the potential of the poisoning. And again, what you're going to see, as with most of these, you're going to kind of see the horse be a little colicky, so their GI tract is kind of upset. And then just a few grazing precautions um, that, that I wanted to cover. But before I do that, do you guys have any questions on the ornamentals or on the tree or woody species? Okay, and there's some questions down there. Um, so Catherine, do you just want to say what IR is? And again, I see some more questions about maple leaves. And Roger, um, do you want to go ahead and, and take some of those questions? But since there's a lot of questions, it's, it's sugar maples. It's really the wilted maples is any plant in the maple family. So that's all the maples. It's even box elder because they're in that same family. Um, so it's all of those types of trees, but again, it's just the wilted. And azaleas, I believe, are in the same family as rhododendron. So again, azalea would be one that you'd want complete, um, that you'd want to, that you would want to avoid completely. And I kind of missed a little bit about the insulin resistance. Um, Catherine said that I, insulin resistant horses can get laminitis from mature acorns. And that is probably true because usually the acorn is a seed and most seeds are sinks for sugars. Um, and the sugars is what causes the insulin resistance. So um, Catherine, if you want to expand on that, go right ahead. But that's probably the basis behind that. All right, any other questions or comments or dialogue? It's a lot more fun when you guys have questions and, and can kind of, you know, uh, also, you know, help teach each other as well. So just a few bra uh, grazing precautions, um, endophyte infected fescue and um, a few little hints about clover. So endophyte uh, infected fescue, first of all, endophyte is something that is beneficial to the fescue. It helps the plant ward off diseases and insects in the natural setting out in the environment. Unfortunately, that endophyte that helps the fescue actually is poisonous to the horse. And what that endophyte causes is dry gangrene um, or, it re or it has vascular constriction of blood flow to the outer extremities. So what you might see is the feet and the ears maybe slough off, although um, 
um, it's more common um, in different species other than horses. The biggest problem, and the problem that you guys are most familiar with, has to do with reproducing horses. So prolonged gestation, um, no milk or limited milk production, or even low sperm cones with stallions. So basically, what you want to look for is, pl is to plant endophyte-free fescue. Um, in a lot of parts of the country, you know, uh, endophyte free is sold, but if you're in a high turf area or a turf production area, the turf people want endophyte fescue because it makes their fescue better. The horse owners do not want the endophyte fescue um, because it causes problems. So if you are in an area that has a strong turf industry, you probably have to watch out more closely than other areas. The next one is, is uh, started talking about clovers, and clovers themselves are not necessarily bad for horses. It's really when the clovers have a mold, either when it's dried in hay or when it's eaten fresh. So I don't want you all to go back and think that clovers are bad. They're not necessarily bad, but what is bad is when the clovers are infected with the mold. So first of all, sweet clover. Sweet clover is in, is in several parts of the country. Um, it looks similar to alfalfa, um, but it's definitely a, a different plant. And you can see the picture here of yellow sweet clover. The problem with yellow sweet clover is that if it's harvested for hay and it isn't dry enough, um, it can get moldy. And unfortunately, when it molds, uh, the mold um, converts naturally occurring coumarol into dicoumarol. And I think everyone has heard of dicoumarol. It's a blood thinner that's used in different types of rodent poisonings. Unfortunately, that moldy sweet clover has the same effect um, as rodent poisonings uh, on our horses. So what you'll see is you'll see a lot of bleeding in the horses if they're eating the moldy sweet clover. But honestly, any type of hay you feed your horse should never be mold. Um, moldy hay is pretty much a death sentence to a lot of horses or at least, or at minimum, a large vet bill or a large hay bill trying to get new hay. So always watch your hay, whether it's sweet clover um, or whether it's any other type of hay. It needs to, to be clean hay um, that is free of weeds and, of course, free of mold. And there are some things you can do with a sweet clover if your horse accidentally ingests some. Um, you can do blood transfusion, which of course can be uh, extremely expensive and should be used in a severe situation. Or you could also give injections of vitamin K. And again, you should always talk about these options um, with your veterinarian. This one here um, isn't actually moldy sweet clover. I'm sorry about that. This is actually red clover. Um, red clover, actually, when it's infected with the mold, can cause slobbers. And I think a, horse people, a lot of horse people have heard slobbers. Um, basically, what happens in hot, humid weather, so a lot of humidity, if you've had a long, rainy stretch and it's been warm, usually above that 80 to 85 degrees, you'll start to see a, a rust-colored mold on the upper sides of the leaves. It isn't rust. Uh, that you see like in cereal grains and on grasses, it's just rust colored. Um, and again, the upper side of the leaves. And the problem is it's the mold that causes the horses to have slobbers. And slobber, slobbers is excessive salivation of the horses. And you'll see them actually little spit bubbles coming out of their mouths at all times. But horses that have had a lot of this can actually salivate like five gallon bucketfuls of spit. Um, it isn't as, as concerning as it looks. It actually isn't harmful to the horse, but the horses can get dehydrated. So you want to make sure um, that if you're suspecting this, to make sure your horses have access to, to a lot of water. And if it does go on for a long time, you're going to want to make sure um, that, that you take your horses out of this moldy area. The mold will naturally run its course um, in about two to four weeks. But if you want to speed that up, you have to increase the airflow to that clover stand um, in your pasture. So things like mowing, um, trying to thin the stand a bit, maybe with a herbicide, or anything you can do to increase the airflow. But of course, if Mother Nature isn't going to help you, there's not a lot you can do but kind of wait. Um, maybe keep your horse out of that area and make sure your horse always has, um, um, always has access to water. The other one is another mold that is associated with all the clovers um, and even to some degree uh, with alfalfa. We've seen one case of this with alfalfa out in Washington State. 
This time the mold is a, called black blotch, and you can physically see black blotches on the underneath side of the clovers or the legumes like alfalfa, and it causes a photosensitive reaction or a severe sunburn, kind of similar symptoms to what you would see with wild parsnip. Again, it's not the clover, it's the mold that causes the problem. So what you would want to do is take the horse out of the sun. There are some topical creams, but also a lot of these photosensitive reactions tend to also interfere with the horse's liver. Um, so you want to make sure that you're monitoring your horse's liver and liver functions um, if you're having trouble with this. So again, this mold usually runs its course in a couple of weeks. Again, increasing air circulation to try to get the mold, try to get that environment to dry out. When it's dry, the mold will not be present any longer. So just a few things about weed control, but before I go on to there, is there any questions you guys have on the poisonous plants I've covered? Myself, Roger, or even between um, <clears throat> the people on the, on the webinar here, we can kind of ask questions and, and uh, try, to, you know, try to learn from each other too. So just a few things on weed control. Really important to remember that a healthy, dense pasture will outcompete most, we uh, most weeds. So how do you get um, a healthy, dense pasture? Well, you're gonna, the biggest key is, and the biggest problem I see with horse owners and their pastures is overgrazing. You need to make sure that you're not overgrazing your pasture. Again, overgrazing opens up areas in the pasture to allow those weed seeds to grow and germinate. If you don't have those openings, in theory, you won't have a weed problem. So again, don't overgraze. Rotationally graze if you can. Rotationally grazing is where you move horses to smaller paddocks, maybe within a larger pasture. And remember that pastures need rest. They need an average of about 30 days of rest for every seven days of grazing. And of course, that can be different um, depending on the year and exactly where you're located. Also things like, um, uh, also things like uh, uh, fertilizing, overseeding <coughs> these uh, thin areas, um, mowing and dragging are all great things. And remember too, herbicides alone, um, will not result in a weed-free pasture. You cannot rely just on herbicides. You want to have an integrated approach with maybe using a herbicide every now and then, but you have to be so careful and read all those instructions very carefully. Um, so again, integrated pasture management is a big key to, uh, to weed control. And I do see some questions on that, and uh, these uh, these topics are recorded. These presentations are recorded because I know it's hard to remember all of this kind of stuff. These uh, presentations are recorded and I believe they are posted on the My Horse University website. So a few more things about weed control. I think we talked about that culturally. <coughs> you do not want to overgraze. Overseed those thin areas. Make sure you're fertilizing. Of course, take a soil test first. Mechanical control is mowing, and then, of course, chemical control is using herbicides. But all of those things are an integrated pasture management, and again, that's what you want to strive for. So just a few steps to minimize poisonous plants. If you don't take anything else away, I, w I really want you to take away these seven steps. Avoid overgrazing. I can't say that enough. Rotate and rest your pastures. Pasture need rest. Mow after grazing. You want to keep it at about four inches. You never want your pasture, either from the horse grazing it or your mower, you really don't want it less than four inches tall. Remove horses from pasture during drought. That is where you see a lot of your poisoning. You think horses have feed. There isn't as much feed as you think, and they're eating plants they normally would not eat. The good news is that horses will, will avoid most of these poisonous plants. They don't taste good, but in a drought or when feed is short, they feel they have no other choice. Remember that a thick, well-managed pasture will outchoke uh, weeds. Herbicides alone will not result in weed-free pasture, and you need to learn to ID these poisonous plants. And I do have some references for you guys. Um, one of the reasons I'm doing this webinar is that we recently published a book. It's Plants, Poisons, or Harmful to Horses in the North Central United States. Uh, it covers all of these plants in much greater detail, plus much greater detail in the um, 
and the horse treatment section. Again, always work with your veterinarian, but that is available on our um, University of Minnesota uh, horse webpage, and you can see that website there. We also have a fact sheet on managing pastures. Again, managing pastures um, and avoiding weeds is a big step in avoiding poisonous plants. And then also Cornell has an excellent website. Um, it has all types of poisonous plants for a number of species. So those are some really good references you guys can take and look. So uh, I think I think that's it. I'll try to take some of these questions here. Um, so one of the questions is, we have a lot of clover in our pasture. In what way is the liver affected in clover? Oops, I just lost it, sorry. In clo clover mold toxins. Well, the, the the liver function is what is affected. So the liver processes is what you'll see, and that can be monitored through a, ver through a variety of tests. But one of your first signs that you'll see is kind of a sunburn or a photosensitive reaction on those horses. So if you see those photosensitive reactions, <clears throat> like sunburning in the white spots, or in a dark horse, if it's very severe, they can actually kind of slough off or peel some skin. That should be your first key to go and monitor those liver functions so you can make sure it hasn't gone to that. Uh, do you think you need to rest an undergrazed pasture? In, uh, all right. Um, an undergrazed pasture. The problem with an undergrazed pasture is, and Roger, I'm going to see here what you're answering. Right, so Roger's right, so only the overgrazed pastures is what needs the official rest. But in undergrazed pasture, horses are very um, picky grazers, or can be. Um, I know a lot of horses are very easy keepers. But the more mature pastures get, sometimes the less palatable or less um, the horses will want to graze them they get. So for a good uniform use of that pasture, um, you want to try to keep it between that 6 to 8 to 10 inches tall, depending on the species and where you're located. Um, uh, and also, if you have that much extra pasture on a yearly basis, maybe you want to set that one pasture aside and harvest it as hay. Uh, hay prices have gone up significantly in the, in the last year or two. So that may be a good way to help manage that and also cut down on your hay costs. And uh, Catherine did say that sugars can increase in weeds after a frost, making them taste better um, and increase the toxicity. That's absolutely right. Um, the, the other issue is that sometimes a herbicide, because a lot of them are a salt-based product, they can sometimes have the same effect. Um, so again, that's part of the grazing restriction, but also because those herbicides can have a residue on the plant um, you know, for a few days. Uh, so that's another reason you want to really watch and read those herbicide labels. Uh, any comments on ragwort? Uh, does it grow in the southeast? Do you have pictures um, of the leaves of the foxtail? All right, Roger, do you want to cover ragwort? And uh, the pictures of the foxtail. The foxtail looks like any other grass, uh, except it can have a more of a flattened stem. It's still round, um, but it tends to be flattened. Uh, it is an annual, so it can um, it won't grow in a clump like orchard grass, um, but it tends. I mean, it, I, I guess it can appear that way. Um, but it mostly kind of grows um, kind of a plant here, a plant there. If it's really thick, it can get sod-like. Um, but again, it has a flattened stem near the base of the soil. Um, and it does tend to be a little bit lighter yellow in color than some of the other, um, than some of the other um, um, beneficial grasses. So foxtails, uh, where is it located in the U.S.? And uh, Catherine has also said that in um, the western United States, their foxtail is a different species, which they refer to it as clump grass. And the foxtail that I'm most familiar with um, 
uh, is not necessarily a clump grass, but the take home message is look at those seed heads. If the seed heads look like a bottle brush, a very coarse bottle brush, you need to be concerned because of those microscopic hooks that get into the, uh, the horse's mouth. Um, and in the book and in some of these um, websites, they have really good pictures um, of these poisonous plants. Any other questions that you guys have? We'd like to thank you for all attending the live web presentation tonight. If you have questions, please email info at myhorseuniversity.com. You can also log on to the website as well and view this recording. We have an another presentation in October with Dr. Karen Waite, and she will be um, talking about the top 10 tips for youth riders. And thank you again to Krishona and to Roger. Have a nice night.